So they continue on through the entire rest of the day and halt again at dusk. Tolkien makes a point to say that hunters have traveled twice 12 leagues. That's 24 leagues, roughly three miles per league. So they just ran 72 miles. That's like insane to me. I don't even want to drive 72 miles and they ran it. Hello everybody. Welcome to Audi and Tulava, where we are walking our way through Tolkien's Legendarium, looking for new insights and a greater understanding of the works that we all love. Today, we're starting chapter two of book three, The Riders of Rohan. As we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, grab a version of the books you don't have in the description below, or join the channel membership community if you would like to support the channel that way. We have a new partnership with the channel also, Chapters Tea and Coffee. Chapters spring from a passion for story. They set out to elevate the stories we all love by teaming up with independent artists to hand draw beautiful imagery and pair it with specially selected artisanal tea. My favorite is Second Breakfast, of course. Go to drinkchapters.com slash Hurin, use the code Hurin15 to get 15% off. I do earn small commission from every bag sold, so thank you in advance. It's a great way to sit down and enjoy the books we all love. That's drinkchapters.com slash Hurin and use code Hurin15 to get 15% off. All right, let's dive in. We join the three hunters as they are working their way out of the Emin Wheel. There in the still cool hour before dawn, they rested for a brief space. The moon had long gone down before them, the stars glittered above them. The first light of day had not yet come over the dark hills behind. For the moment, Aragorn was at a loss. The orc trail had descended into the valley, but there it had vanished. Which way would they turn, do you think, said Legolas, northward to take a straighter road to Isengard? Or Fangorn, if that is their aim as you guess? Or southward to strike the Entwash? They will not make for the river, whatever mark they aim at, said Aragorn. And unless there is much amiss in Rohan and the power of Sauron is greatly increased, they will take the shortest way that they can find over the fields of the Rohirrim. Let us search northwards. So they're in the Aemon Wheel, basically an area like a bunch of hills. They reach a valley in between a couple of hills. It's too rocky to follow the trail of the orcs. Likely it was like, you know, stream bed or something like that. But anyway, they lose the trail. Which way are the orcs gonna, orcs gonna go? Are they going south to the or at wash or northwest to Isengard or Fangorn? Aragorn makes a pretty strong assertion the orcs will not go to the river. Why? Well, we don't officially know, but he follows it up saying the orcs will take the shortest route to Isengard since he seems pretty confident in his guess from the last chapter that the S rune is for Sauron. And they'll take that route because the Rohirrim will probably still take offense to a bunch of orcs hanging out in their land. And the orcs want the shortest route over the plains of Rohan because a warrior society based on horseback probably wouldn't have a, an extremely hard time chasing them down and destroying them, hint, hint. And they're not gonna go south because if we remember correctly, the biggest orcs from Parth Gallen all had the S rune. So it's pretty safe assumption that they would make the decisions that they're making or that Aragorn is thinking that they're gonna make. As they continue, they come across five orc bodies laying on the ground. We've already overtaken some of those that we are hunting. He said, look, he pointed and they saw that what they had at first taken to be boulders lying at the foot of the slope were huddled bodies. Five dead orcs lay there. They had been hewn with many cruel strokes and two had been beheaded. The ground was wet with their dark blood. Legolas is the optimistic one here. Any enemy of our enemy is our friend. No, said Aragorn, the Rohirrim seldom come here and it is far from Minas Tirith. It might be that some company of men were hunting here for reasons that we do not know. Yet I think not. Well, what do you think, said Gimli. I think that the enemy brought his own enemy with him, answered Aragorn. These are northern orcs from far away. Among the slain are none of the great orcs with the strange badges. There was a quarrel, I guess. It is no uncommon thing with these foul folk. Maybe there was some dispute about the road or about the captives, said Gimli. Let us hope that they too did not meet their end here. So as I'm going through this right now, I have to wonder if Legolas and Gimli are really used to like critical thinking. Nothing actually like against them, but like, come on guys. Legolas jumps to, cool, they're killing the guys we don't like. Gimli at least asks questions, but he doesn't stop and like think. Like at all. I mean, they're all under stress, so they're definitely going to be tired. But like, it's a little interesting that Aragorn is really the only one with critical thinking skills right now. But what I do love about this is Aragorn and how right he is about pretty much everything. Every guess of his proves pretty accurate. His choices prove to go well for them, especially if you use hindsight, you know, like in a few chapters. After days of being frustrated with all his choices going ill and the company dissolving, as he seemed to think because of his choices, it's nice to see things starting to go his way. And if you think about it, it's not terribly surprising that he's continually correct in this chapter. If you look at his life, it's been hard. He spent time fighting alongside the Rohirrim and spent years in Gondor fighting to protect them as well. His life has been about survival. He didn't really have like 
he didn't really have a home where he like got to go and stay. He had to make good decisions based on the information like this all the time. And the results could have been his life or the life of others. You, I, well, I can assume you learn pretty quickly when the stakes are like that. Now, as we find out in the next chapter, this will be that interlacing we talked about last video. Feel free to check that one out. There was a disagreement with the different types of orcs. And as Aragorn searches around and starts to follow a stream, we get confirmation that his guesses are correct. At last, said Aragorn, here are the tracks that we seek. Up this water channel, this is the way that the orcs went after their debate. Swiftly now, the pursuers turned and followed the new path. As if fresh from a night's rest, they sprang from stone to stone. At last, they reached the crest of the gray hill and a sudden breeze blew in their hair and stirred their cloaks, the chill wind of dawn. I love this part. Tolkien is really leaning into the idea of the three hunters. In the wild, predator animals will get like, you know, a boost of adrenaline and their instincts just take over when it's time to follow their prey. And we're seeing that here, but like better. Legolas, Gimli, and Aragorn aren't following the orcs for their own survival, it's for the survival of others, Merry and Pippin. It's the protection of those that need protection. And this whole chase is the idea that things must be done correctly. The ends do not justify the means, so they're seemingly abandoning the quest of fighting Sauron by chasing after Merry and Pippin, who, at least on the surface, have nothing to do with the war that's about to start. So as they take off after the orcs, morning comes. Turning back, they saw across the river the far hills kindled. Day leaped into the sky. The red rim of the sun rose over the shoulders of the dark land. Before them in the west, the world lay still, formless and gray. But even as they looked, the shadows of night melted. The colors of the waking earth returned. Green flowed over the wide meadows of Rohan. The white mists shimmered in the water veils. And far off to the left, 30 leagues or more, blue and purple stood the white mountains, rising to peaks of jet tipped with glimmering snow, flushed with the rose of morning. Gondor, Gondor, cried Aragorn. Would that I looked on you again in happier hour. Not yet does my road lie southward to your bright streams. Gondor, Gondor, between the mountains and the sea, west wind blew there the light upon the silver tree, fell like bright rain in gardens of the kings of old. O proud walls, white towers, O winged crown and throne of gold, O Gondor, Gondor, shall men behold the silver tree, or west wind blow again between the mountains and the sea. Now let us go, he said, drawing his eyes away from the south and looking out west and north to the way that he must tread. First paragraph about the sun rising. Well, I don't honestly have a whole lot to say about it. It's just amazing. The shadow of night melted. The colors of the waking earth returned. The color green flowing like a river over the plains. He had a way with words. They look south, they see the white mountains, and Aragorn reminds us that that land is Gondor, and we get a poem, which we love, right? This poem, it's a little complicated for me. I'm still learning and practicing how to dissect things like this, but it seems to be iambic tetrameter again, which honestly is kind of a safe bet with Tolkien. And yes, Hobbit meter is iambic tetrameter, but personally, and we'll we'll let Corey Olson get to this, you know, talk about this when he gets here in like 12 years, but I wouldn't personally call this Hobbit meter. The poems made by Hobbits are all very like close to, they're, they're close at least, they're perfectly iambic. Two syllables, unstressed, stressed, ba 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 ba. But Aragorn's poem here throws in extra syllables. One reason I had a hard time finding the rhythm in this one. But that's what you're gonna get. As they started to move away, Legolas sees an eagle. Look, cried Legolas, pointing up into the pale sky above them. There is the eagle again. He is very high, he seems to be flying now away from this land back to the north. He is going with great speed. Look, is this the same eagle that Aragorn saw in his vision on top of him and him? No idea. But what I think is this is how Gandalf gets to Fangorn from Lorien. I don't think it's Gwai here, as Gandalf says later that third time pays for all when he asks Gwai here to take him to Mount Doom from the Black Gate. And he already carried Gandalf twice away from Orthanc and down from the mountaintops of Moria. This doesn't really change anything about the book or the reading, but it's something I like to think. Makes me, you know, feel warm and fuzzy. As the hunters continue, they come out of the rocky hills of the Emin Wheel and into Rohan. At the bottom they came with a strange suddenness on the grass of Rohan. It swelled like a green sea up to the very foot of the Emin Wheel. The falling stream vanished into a deep growth of cresses and water plants, and they could hear it tinkling away in green tunnels down long, gentle slopes towards the fens of the Entwash Vale far away. They seemed to have left winter clinging to the hills behind. Here the air was softer and warmer and faintly scented, as if spring was already stirring and the sap was flowing again in herb and leaf. Legolas took a deep breath, like one that drinks a great draught after a long thirst in barren places. This is another section I, I, I don't have a whole lot to say about it. I just, 
It is so beautiful, I had to read it. This is the type of thing that I mean when you hear me say things like his prose makes like a movie run through my head. You feel the warm air, the soft springy grass under your feet, and you hear the water softly murmuring through its course. Over the grass, the light feet of the three hunters pass, and we get another bit of interlacing, at least We'll see it as interlacing when we get to the next chapter. Stay, he shouted, do not follow me yet. He ran quickly to the right, away from the main trail, for he had seen footprints that went that way, branching off from the others, the marks of small, unshod feet. These, however, did not go far before they were crossed by orc prints, also coming out from the main trail behind and in front, and then they curved sharply back again and were lost in the trampling. At the furthest point, Aragorn stooped and picked up something from the grass. Then he ran back. Yes, he said, they are quite plain, a hobbit's footprints. Pippin's, I think. He is smaller than the others. And look at this. He held up a thing that glittered in the sunlight. It looked like a new opened leaf of a beech tree, fair and strange in that treeless plain. So we're getting another piece of the story of what Merry and Pippin experienced with the orcs, but we're currently days later and going on, you know, the educated guesses of Aragorn. We'll find out later Pippin did just about the smartest thing he does in the entire book. He veers out of the path of all the heavy orc boots so his tracks will be visible. He drops the brooch that was holding his cloak on to give Aragorn a sign that they are still alive. And it does call back a little bit to the stone Aragorn finds at the bridge as he and the hobbits were trying to get to Rivendell. It's a sign that they are on the right path and not all is lost yet. It's just another thing that like helps keep them going. Each bit a new piece of the puzzle but enough evidence to show them the hobbits are alive that they can keep pressing on until they find the next, like, the next clue. But in the meantime, they're literally running all day with two short rests the entire day and night is falling. Do they rest or do they keep going? And it's a really difficult and important question. The orcs have been running all day under the sun. They don't usually do that. So they will clearly keep running through the night, which is when they normally are out. But what if the hobbits escape and run off the path again? In the dark, especially with the moon shrouded in cloud, those light tracks would easily be missed. Not even to mention the fact that it would be hard to even follow the regular trail of orcs in the dark. Like, have you ever been out in the country, like really far out where there's essentially no light pollution? It's both awe-inspiring and terrifying. You can look up, see stars you would never have imagined were there. So many stars. But when you look down, there's just nothing. There's nothing to see. It's just dark. That is the type of dark the hunters are getting into. Like, it's complete. Aragorn again asks how they're going to end the debate. You are our guide, said Gimli and you are skilled in the chase, you shall choose. My heart bids me go on, said Legolas, but we must hold together, I will follow your counsel. You give the choice to an ill chooser, said Aragorn. Since we passed through the Argonoth, my choices have gone amiss. He fell silent, gazing north and west into the gathering night for a long while. We will not walk in the dark, he said at length. The peril of missing the trail or signs of other coming and going seemed to me the greater. If the moon gave enough light, we would use it, but alas, he sets early and is yet young and pale. And tonight he is shrouded anyway, Gimli murmured. Would that the lady had given us a light such a gift as she gave to Frodo. It will be more needed where it is bestowed, said Aragorn. With him lies the true quest. Ours is but a small matter in the great deeds of this time, a vain pursuit from its beginning, maybe, which no choice of mine can mar or mend. Well, I have chosen, so let us use the time as best we may. We can kind of see Gimli here is just kind of along for the ride at this point. Well, I guess that sounds kind of uncharitable. He is there for the hobbits, but I think at this point he's tired. He's so tired, he doesn't really care what they do as long as they keep trying to rescue the hobbits at some point. Legolas, of course, wants to keep going. I mean, he might be able to see the path well enough at night to follow, but I doubt he has the skill of Aragorn to really, truly follow the tracks. And have you noticed how he doesn't really seem to be tired? At this point in the book, we don't really know that much about elves. We have bits and pieces, you know, of how great Elrond is and, you know, how Glorfindel is so powerful he would alert Sauron to their presence. But we don't have like a practical sense of what that is or what it looks like. We're starting to get that here a little bit. They've been running for two days with a short little, like call it a four hour rest last night. And he just wants to keep on going. I think this is a pretty big thing we learn about elves at this point. And Legolas is lowly Cinderin elf who never even got to see the light of the two trees. So they rest. As Aragorn wakes, Legolas is just standing there, sad. He knows the orcs have kept going with the hobbits. It's starting to become hopeless. Even his elf eyes can't see the company of orcs passing over the plains. So Aragorn lays down to listen to the ground. The rumor of the earth is dim and confused, he said. Nothing walks upon it for many miles about us. Faint and far are the feet of our enemies, but loud are the hooves of the horses. It comes to my mind that I heard them, even as I lay on the ground in sleep, and they troubled my dreams. Horses galloping, passing in the west, but now they are drawing ever further from us, riding northward. I wonder what is happening in this land. Let us go, said Legolas. 
So we get a bit of foreshadowing here. Aragorn hears the orcs running across the ground, but hears horses galloping much louder. And the horses are galloping away from them. We'll find the Rohirrim coming back towards the hunters the next day after their fight with the orcs. So again, we'll learn Aragorn is basically completely correct in what he's finding with his tracking skills. So they continue on through the entire rest of the day and halt again at dusk. Tolkien makes a point to say the hunters have traveled twice 12 leagues. That's 24 leagues, roughly three miles per league. So they just ran 72 miles. That's like insane to me. I don't even want to drive 72 miles and they ran it. It's a miracle that they're on their feet at all, really. I mean, my, like my old soccer coach, he does ultra marathon stuff now, which is honestly pretty crazy. But I doubt Aragorn, and Legolas and Gimli were really out there just spending hours and hours running each day to like train for ultra marathons. They just kind of had a task to fulfill and they're doing it. Legolas really doesn't like that they've rested so much though. Now do I most grudge a time of rest or any halt in our chase, said Legolas. The orcs have run before us as if the very whips of Sauron were behind them. I fear they have already reached the forest on the dark hills and even now are passing into the shadows of the trees. Gimli ground his teeth. This is a bitter end to our hope and to all our toil, he said. To hope, maybe, but not to toil, said Aragorn. We shall not turn back here, yet I am weary. He gazed back along the way that they had come towards the night gathering in the east. There is something strange at work in this land. I distrust the silence. I distrust even the pale moon. The stars are faint, and I am weary as I have seldom been before, weary as no ranger should be with a clear trail to follow. There is some will that lends speed to our foes and sets an unseen barrier before us, a weariness that is in the heart more than in the limb. Truly, said Legolas, that I have known since first we came down from the M.M. Wheel. For the will is not behind us, but before us. He pointed away over the land of Rohan into the darkling west under the sickle moon. A couple things here to go over in this passage. First is to make sure we pay attention to what Gimli says about hope. Legolas thinks the orcs kept moving and are probably at Fangorn now, and there's no way they can be caught by the three hunters. Gimli takes this as gospel and says it's a crappy end to their hope and toil. He's talking about Amdir here. It's the hope of the present. Things will work out. It's a big difference, remember, between Amdir and Estel. Estel is the hope and a higher power that things ultimately will, will work out, like on that ultimate level. So Gimli here is losing Amdir, that they will find the hobbits alive and well. Then Aragorn points out that their toil is not over yet. They still need to run after the orcs and do whatever they can for the hobbits, hopeless or no. But he also notes that there's something in the air. He's weary as no ranger should be with a trail to follow. He doesn't even trust the stars or the moon. And that's a pretty big statement coming from him, almost as bad as if it came from a Noldor, say, like Glorfindel. Why? I'm glad you asked. In Middle-earth, the moon is a vessel made by Aule and carried by the Maya Tilian. That vessel holds the last radiance of a flower from Telperion, the oldest of, or the older of the two trees of Valinor. The stars were kindled by Varda, the wife of the most powerful Vala, Manwe. We hear Gildor and his troop of Noldor reference her in the third chapter of the Fellowship. Aragorn, being in the lineage of his Sildur and the faithful before him, would be aware of this. So it's almost like he's saying he doesn't trust the Valar right now even though the moon isn't capitalized, so he may not be referring to its Maya technically. That is something Corey Olson is continually exploring in his podcast, where there really is a, rather, whether there really is a, a rhyme or reason to when and why Tolkien capitalizes the sun and moon, but that is outside the scope of this current video. Aragorn says his weariness is more of heart than body, and Legolas points towards Isengard, the fortress of Saruman. They are certain at this point that Saruman is against them and has some sort of compact with orcs they've never seen before. But they strengthen their wills and refuse to be turned back by the rogue wizard, and they lay down to rest. As before, Legolas was first afoot, if indeed he had ever slept. Awake, awake, he cried. It is a red dawn. Strange things await us by the ease of the forest. Good or evil, I do not know, but we are called. Awake. The others sprang up and almost at once they set off again. Now, I don't know how much sleep Aragorn and Gimli got, but I have to give them credit for literally, like, jumping up and running away immediately. I can barely get out of bed in the morning to get to work. But off they go, and they find an orc encampment. Aragorn guesses they camped there 36 hours ago, so they're pretty far behind him at this point. And on they run. They must rest again at the end of the day. The night grew ever colder. Aragorn and Gimli slept fitfully, and whenever they awoke, they saw Layla standing beside them or walking to and fro, singing softly to himself in his own tongue. And as he sang, the white stars opened in the hard black vault above. So the night passed. Together they watched the dawn grow slowly in the sky, now bare and cloudless, until at last the sunrise came. It was pale and clear. 
The wind was in the east and all the mists had rolled away. Wide lands lay bleak about them in the bitter light. This is another section I don't have too much to really say. It's just, it's just so evocative to hear about Legolas singing and stars open in the hard black vault above. There is an interesting reference to the Aino Lindale, or music of the Ainur. It wasn't exactly the creation of the world. They had to work on a blank canvas to like create everything. But we often see like magic being acted out via song and music. Legolas is copying Varda in like, kindling the stars here. And it brings my mind back to Aragorn saying he doesn't trust the stars just a couple pages back. He didn't trust the stars, but now they react to the voice of Legolas and perhaps Aragorn can trust them again, maybe? You know, he can believe in Varda again. Maybe he has Amdir again because of the magic of the elves in their singing. As they start again the next morning, Aragorn sees a black shape moving on the plains. He lays down to listen again. Riders, cried Aragorn, springing to his feet. Many riders on swift seeds are coming towards us. Yes, said Legolas, there are 105. Yellow is their hair and bright are their spears. Their leader is very tall. Aragorn smiled. Keen are the eyes of the elves, he said. Nay, the riders are little more than five leagues distant, said Legolas. Five leagues or one, said Gimli. We cannot escape them in this bare land. Shall we wait for them here or go on our way? We will wait, said Aragorn. I am weary and our hunt has failed. Or at least others were before us, for these horsemen are riding back down the orc trail. We may get news from them. So the riders Aragorn heard two days ago before riding away from them are coming back down the trail they are now following. And again, we see a bit more about the power here of Legolas or elves or whatever. It's almost like Tolkien is just kind of dishing out piece by piece like information about Legolas and the elves just, you know, here and there a little bit as we go. So we don't like we don't start off thinking, oh, they're all just amazing and, you know, don't believe in their trials like, oh, it shouldn't be anything for them. They'll just figure it out easy. But here we get just a little bit more about how he's really just a more powerful being than mere humans or dwarves. They decide to sit and wait for the riders. The three companions now left the hilltop where they might be an easy mark against the pale sky, and they walked slowly down the northward slope. A little above the hill's foot they halted, and wrapping their cloaks about them, they sat huddled together upon the faded grass. The time passed slowly and heavily. The wind was thin and searching. Gimli was uneasy. What do you know of these horsemen, Aragorn, he said. Do we sit here waiting for sudden death? I have been among them, answered Aragorn. They are proud and willful, but they are true-hearted, generous in thought and deed, bold but not cruel, wise but unlearned, writing no books but singing many songs after the manner of the children of men before the dark years. But I do not know what has happened here of late, nor in what mind the Rohirrim may now be between the traitor Sauron and the threat of Sauron. They have long been the friend of the people of Gondor, though they are not akin to them. It was in forgotten years long ago that Errol the Young brought them out of the north, and their kinship is rather with the Bardings of Dale, with the Bjornings of the Wood, among whom may still be seen many men tall and fair as are the riders of Rohan. At least they will not love the orcs. They seem to think that sitting down in the open and wrapping their Lorien cloaks around them will suffice, and it honestly probably will. We'll talk more about that in the next video, but let's take a second and talk about what Aragorn says about the Rohirrim. He says he's been among them. So Hammon and Skull note that in the tale of Aragorn and Arwen in Appendix A, it says he rode with the Rohirrim. They're unlearned, really just meaning they don't have scholarship and don't like read and write, but he mentions they sing songs like the children of the men before the dark years. So generally speaking, the dark years are during the second age when Sauron was ruling in Middle-earth as well as Sauron or Anatar or whatever. So when Aragorn says children of men before the dark years, it sounds like he's making a reference to the men in the first age. I believe here he's referencing those men that like Finrod first met, or at least similar to them. They had their own history, but it was passed down by song and tale rather than by writing. It makes me think of the conversation Finrod also had with Andreth, where you can find in Morgoth's Ring, which is volume 10 of History of Middle-earth. Andreth learned her lore and has incorrect beliefs about death because of the tradition of her house and the lies that Morgoth told them. I don't think Aragorn is belittling the Rohirrim here, he's just being frank, but he still seems to like them. Unfinished Tales gives us the story of Kyrian and Eora. I recommend you read it. It's a cool story of how the Rohirrim lived much further north, kind of Mirkwoody up, up there, until the steward of Gondor, Kyrian, asked for their help to defend Gondor against the Wayne Riders. Eorl rode down, saved them, and the, and the like, like current day Rohan was given to them as thanks, as well as political reasons like protecting Gondor's north border. Again, check out the full Ur story, at least, in Unfinished Tales. Gimli then brings up what was said in the Council of Elrond, that they may give tribute to Mordor. 
Aragorn, going right along with what he just said, states he doesn't believe it, and I'll leave Legolas to give us our last passage of this week's video. You will soon learn the truth, said Legolas, already they approach. And that's where we'll wrap up this week's video. We'll continue Riders of Rohan in the next video next time. Thank you all so much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, buy a new version of the book you don't already have in the description, or you know, join the channel membership. And don't forget to claim your 15% off chapters tea and coffee, the book, and these videos are best enjoyed with a lovely beverage on hand. And until next time, always remember, Ali and Tulva, they shall come again.